No, we shall not elevate one Christian denomination above another Christian denomination and make it the state church. You all know this. In 1802, when Thomas Jefferson on New Year's Day wrote that group of Danbury Baptists, uh, they had heard the rumor that Jefferson was about to make the Congregational Church the state church. And we Baptists get really nervous if anybody else is going to be in charge but us. And so they expressed their concern to Thomas Jefferson. And that's when he wrote that letter to reassure them that there would not be a state church. And he invoked that phrase from Roger Williams, the separation of church and state. But when the First Amendment talks about no establishment of religion, they're talking about a state religion, one Christian denomination over another. But that doesn't mean that our country did not favor the Christian religion. You say, how do you know that, Pastor? How do you know you're not just reading back your own views into history? Supreme Court Associate Justice Joseph Story was appointed to the bench by President James Madison in 1811. Now, who was James Madison? He was the father of the Constitution, wasn't he? So when he appointed Joseph Story to the Supreme Court, you can make sure Madison was going to appoint somebody who had his understanding of the Constitution. How did Joseph Story interpret the First Amendment? Well, he wrote about it in his commentary on the Constitution. And listen to what Joseph Story said about the First Amendment. Quote, the real object of the First Amendment was not to countenance, much less to advance Islam or Judaism or infidelity by prostrating Christianity. The purpose was to exclude all rivalry among Christian sects and to prevent any national ecclesiastical establishment which should give to a hierarchy the exclusive patronage of the national government. Now that's Joseph's story, afforded by James Madison. Joseph's story, who was living at the same time when many of those who had penned and ratified the Constitution lived. Now, who has a better insight into what our framers meant when they wrote the First Amendment? Somebody who was a contemporary of the framers? Somebody appointed by James Madison? Or some pinhead judge today, 150 <laughs> years later, who is trying to force a secular progressive agenda down the throats of the American people? No, our country was built on religious freedom. We can worship any God or no God. But that doesn't mean our court did not have a preference for Christianity. 1811, the people versus rebels. We are a Christian nation, and the morality of our country is deeply engrafted upon Christianity and not upon the doctrines or worship of imposter religions. Can you imagine the Supreme Court saying something like that today? <laughs> yeah. Joseph's uh, uh, John Jay, the first Chief Justice of our Supreme Court, talks about America being a Christian nation. What I'm saying to you is, although we certainly celebrate the freedom of religion, it doesn't mean we have to be neutral as a country. There's nothing in the First Amendment that prevents uh, the display of nativity scenes in the town square. The founders had nothing to say about prayers at graduation. Uh, exercises. It had nothing to say about Ten Commandment displays. All the First Amendment talked about was forcing people to worship a God they chose not to worship. That is what true tolerance is. It allows for preferences. You know, when we talk about, in closing, how do we deal with a culture that is so and increasingly opposed to the principles of Christianity? Well, I think we follow the model of Jesus. You know, when you look at Jesus Christ, contrary to a lot of popular images of Jesus, Jesus was not this little wimpy rabbi who walked around the hillside, you know, eating bird seed and saying nice things to people. That was not <laughs> Jesus. Jesus was very strong in his convictions. For example, in Matthew 10, 24, he said, Do not think I came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring, I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. Have you ever seen that on a Christmas card? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Or Luke 15, 21, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and his wife and children and brothers and sisters, and yes, even his own wife, he cannot be my disciple. Jesus was very firm in his beliefs. 
But interesting, he was very soft, tender when it came to individual people. Well, except for the religious hypocrites, the Pharisees. But whether it was the woman of the well or Nicodemus, Jesus was firm in his beliefs, but he was soft with people. He's what I call a velvet-covered brick. And you know, I think if we're going to affect our okay. culture, we have to have that same balance. When it comes to our convictions, we have to be very, very strong. When it comes to people, we ought to be very, very tender. That says we have it to right show there. respect to other people. Mm -hmm. I think we approve of their behavior. We give them the right. that God gives them the right to be wrong. And in the end, we have to remember the purpose of engaging the culture is not to win the argument. It's to win the person. And that's the goal of true tolerance. Before I turn it back over to Sandy, any quick questions? Oh, I've gone too long. Yes. Okay. But we're going to do that. Okay. I'll say one.